Liebe Frau Hartmann, lieber Matti Geschenek, Miss Hartmann, Matti Geschenek, Shelly Kupferberg, Shelly Kupferberg. Ich wollte auch sagen, liebe Martin Moskowitz. I also wanted to say Martin Moskowitz, hello to you, but he hasn't arrived yet. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you very, very cordially here at the Academy of the Arts. I am very happy that we can make our rooms available for today's screening of the film and by doing that support the work of the memorial and educational site. What remains after 80 years? Valshintov said the secret of redemption is memory, remembrance. This has often been quoted, but do we really understand what that means? How does memory, remembrance work in today's world of Facebook and Instagram, where millions of clicks always belong to the latest and loudest news? And what is remembrance for those who do not want to remember the perpetrators, the collaborators, those who were born later, who believe that the Shoah doesn't matter anymore for them. Education and memorial is part of this, this archive, this can help to educate on February 15th, 1933, 16 days after the rise to power of the National Socialist, the um, Prussian Minister of Cultural Affairs, De Rust, tried to blame Heinrich Mann and Käthe Kollwitz and pushed them out of the Academy of the Arts, together with other intellectuals. These two, Mann and Kollwitz, had signed the urgent appeal of the International Socialist Working Association, which tried to prevent fascism winning at the next elections. Rust used this as a pretext to demand they leave the academy, otherwise he threatened to dissolve the institution. He was supported by the president of the academy, Max von Schillings. Käthe Kollwitz and Heinrich Mann drew the consequences and left to avoid consequences for the community of artists. The National Socialists took over the Academy without a lot of resistance. The Academy regretted the leaving of the two, but there was not a lot of resistance. Ricarda Huch, the President of Honor, Max Liebermann, were among the only ones who dared to resist and left the Academy. Many of the remaining artists quickly followed the direction of the new regime and participated in the restructuring. The section for poetry in March of 1933 required its members to declare their loyalty vis-à-vis -vis the National Socialist State. The institution consequently lost its moral integrity and lost the importance it used to have in the cultural life of the Weimar Republic. Between 1933 and 1938, 41 members, because of political reasons or their um, Jewish heritage were excluded and forced to leave the academy. The names of these members can be read on the facade of the building next to the entrance. The history of the Academy of the Arts is an example that highlights how quickly things can change. 
So it needs to be told again and again. This history, this story needs to be repeated and we shall not forget it. We remember the Shoah, the millions of people who were killed. We remember what happened to not make the mistake of feeling safe without really being safe. Freedom and democratic structures aren't self-evident. In his book, February 1933, Uwe Wittstock writes about the danger, how big it was and how underestimated it was, how very quickly after Hitler came into power, it just took four weeks, he passed the emergency legislation to protect the people and the state and basically all democratic citizens' rights were um, neglected. Since that time, the unimaginable has become imaginable. The Shoah happened, the decision for the complete extermination of the Jews was taken at the Wannsee Conference, that's where it was planned, and as far as possible, it was implemented. But what images, shapes, what forms and language can we find to appropriately describe the unimaginable and really embed it in the consciousness of people? Can this be achieved at all? There are at least two films about the Wannsee Conference, 84, directed by Heinz Schirk and Paul Momitz, and Conspiracy from 2001 with Frank Pearson, with Kenneth Branagh and Stanley Tucci. Very realistic feature films. There are numerous documentaries focusing on the Shoah, beginning with um, Nui Bouya, Nach den Nebel by um, Alain René, Claude Lassmann, Shoah, the trial, a presentation of the Majdanek proceedings in Düsseldorf, the movies by Marcel, um, Mark Ophüls, Marcel Ophüls, um, Wolfgang Stautes, Die Mörder sind unter uns, from 1946, and others, to just name a few to keep the memory alive. Hours of material from the interview of Eichmann in Jerusalem. We can use this to keep asking questions, keep communicating with the younger generation, but it's not enough. It will never be enough. We have to keep talking about it. We have to keep the memory alive. This is the only hope for education to prevail. Now, the great director, Mati Geschonek, who has already shot a lot of feature films and documentaries, taken over the chair of the director, this attempt to take this unbelievable, unimaginable event and present it, his decision to have the actors act in a very cold way, epically, along the teachings of Brecht, is one of the strengths of this film. You will be able to see the rest yourselves. Thank you very much. Sehr geehrte Professor Meer Apfel, Mati Geschonek, dear guests, I am here very briefly on behalf of the House of the Wannsee Conference Memorial and Educational Site. We just wanted to say thank you very much for being here on January 20th. We have just concluded two days of conference with very intensive discussions, and we're very happy that this part of the conference finds Another way of closing the conference, looking at this situation in a different way, not from a pedagogical educational point of view, but um, looking at this, watching this film, some of you, um, some of us have already seen it, and um, it is really great. And after the film, after the showing, we will also have a discussion that will be streamed again. So thank you very much.
starting up there from the technicians. Uh, my name is uh, Shelley Kupferberg. I'm a freelance journalist and I am going to be your facilitator today. And um, I'm going to uh, lead us uh, through our discussion here with Mati Geschanik, our director. Um, we heard um, a bit about him from Janine Merve already. Mati Geschenik, he is, yeah, there he is. Great to have you. And after a long day, or two days, actually, of a conference, um, 80 years um, of Wannsee Conference, um, that's uh, a full schedule for them. And uh, Deborah Hartmann, um, head of the host of the Wannsee Conference, a memorial and educational site, is joining us tonight as well. Debbie, thank you so, so much much for joining us. And I would also like to welcome Martin Moskovic, um, the CEO of Konstantin Film. He is also going to join us here on the panel. Mr. Moskovic, thank you so much. And uh, well, we have um, a couple of people here amongst our audience. Um, Reinhold Elschott, um, over there, producer from the ZDF, and a couple of actors as well, Jakob Diel, Philipp Hochmeier, and Peter Jordan. I'd like to welcome you all as well. And we figured that we'd want to start with a panel discussion uh, here amongst ourselves, but also then invite you uh, later on to share your comments or impressions and also invite uh, uh, others, protagonists, actors and actresses that uh, were involved in the production and um, you might even have questions for them. Now, Mati Geschanik, um, I'd like to start with um, you, Mr. Meerapfel talked uh, about a very sober uh, setup of the movie. And um, you know, if something like this is offered to you as a director, how do you decide how to approach that? I mean, we all have certain associations, uh, terminology, and uh, body language that we associate with national socialism. How do you approach that? <coughs> Well, let me also uh, welcome you all. And um, yes, well, which mood to set? Um, that's a good question. And I didn't actually accept um, you know, this project right away. It, it took a while, or about a year, to think about it um, and think about the challenges. And I, I wasn't really uh, decided right off the bat. Um, but I realized that as a prerequisite to really going through with this project um, was to, to have the whole setting set up in a way that would be similar to a board meeting, for example, because you would know what you want to do, but you don't really know how to do it, as we know from having our production meetings as well. So I knew that I wanted to have a movie without music. That, that was one of the, the requirements that I, I thought about you know, in this long process of, of considering this project. And I think that really sets the tone. Because doing that means um, having a lot of risk as well. You know, having a feature film without music, that's a film that very much relies on the acting, you know, the respective actors, how they play, how they fill their roles, how they set the mood. And um, that was a very uh, business like approach that we decided on uh, in the face of uh, these unimaginable. Uh, discussions that took place that also has a lot to do with rhythm, uh, the question of how to work with the actors. Um, we didn't do any rehearsals uh, because the actors that I ultimately selected, um, I, I did also taking a certain risk because sure, Heidrich is a certain uh, central figure there, but there is no one protagonist um, because ultimately it's the whole ensemble. And that is quite a challenge um, for all of them. And to create an imagery that has to well, be maintained over 
a normal feature of film length, so almost two hours, and that was a meeting, a consultation that we know very little about, and it, um, as well, it took about 90 minutes. Well, I have to be honest with you, um, I was glad there was no music um, as part of that feature film, because um, I, I think that would have made it even more um, dramatic. And it was very much focused on the actors, ultimately. And um, Debbie, I've known you for quite a while, and um, you are in your current position at the House of the Wannsee Conference for about a year now. You were also visiting the set. What does that mean for you, you know, working at a place like this, knowing what happened there. What does that mean for you, uh, personally? Well, my <laughs> colleagues are laughing than the audience, <laughs> because, um, of, I mean, this is a question that uh, comes up now and then. Uh, so I wasn't uh, on the set. Um, the uh, actual scenes uh, inside the building didn't happen at the um, house at the Wannsee. Um, just the uh, exterior uh, shots uh, happened there. So it, it was an interesting uh, experience uh, because I actually returned to Berlin. I hadn't returned for quite some time. So I came back, started uh, working at the uh, house um, of the Wannsee conference. And, you know, then at some point, um, I, I saw how you know the, the um, exterior of um, the house and the premises changed and were changed in a way to resemble what they um, were thought to have been like um, on uh, the 20th um, of January 42. And you know, then we also saw Heinrich arrive uh, on scene on set, and it, it was bizarre because uh, the as was standing at our doors in a way. Now, at the same time, it, it was very interesting to see the house, and we very much uh, talked about symbolism in this context, uh, the symbolism of this house, um, and to really perceiving this uh, in the context, you know, thinking of the history, of its backstory, of what happened in 1942, uh, what happened afterwards, um, you know, what's this building's history, and also seeing the interpretation that happened in the context of a feature film, and experiencing all this was interesting. Martin Moskovich, um, of course, you've not always been present on set uh, or in the cause of this uh, project. I'd still like to ask you, what does that mean for you, for Konstantin Film? And uh, Janine Meamfe mentioned that uh, they've already been two uh, feature films uh, of the uh, Wannsee Conference. Now, it's a third one, and um, I, I, maybe somewhat provocatively asked, um, did we really need a third one? And what do you think about it? Now, first of all, um, great to be here. And I didn't follow this uh, production as a producer myself. I, I knew about it. I read the script. I obviously watched uh, the film when it was finished. And we are very much proud of it. We are proud of uh, having been able to do it. I think it's a very important uh, film, not just for Constantine film, but for everyone watching it and for you know, everyone that might uh, not be that sure what happened back then, what the actual history was. So I think it's, it's important that we uh, did this again. I mean, I've uh, watched one of um, the uh, prior installations, and you know, they were shot quite some time ago, and they took a different approach. So I believe that what Matigeshenik, his team, and all the actors, what they did, that is remarkable. It is uh, unique, and in its intensity, I've uh, watched this uh, movie once, and uh, I, I couldn't watch it again. 
bin natürlich, I, vielleicht ist es auch ein Grund, warum ich heute hier sitze. Um, and maybe that's why I'm here today. I've been invited as well because it's part of my family history, how a, a large part of uh, my family died. And the murder of my family was decided on that day in that building. And for me, it is a very emotional uh, event, watching it, uh, seeing it happen, and also seeing uh, something that could be described as, as the monstrosity of the normality of it all. And following this, I think, is extremely important, especially showing this to young people, people that uh, might not know as much about it, about the background, and um, the uh, ZF um, does a great job of, uh, you know, covering the, the backstory, providing additional information. So I think this is absolutely important to do because it is not um, as it is often depicted on the news, um, you know, I've just read that about that today, uh, talking uh, about uh, the, the monsters, uh, uh, the beasts at work there, and it, it weren't really. It's just your average bureaucrat, your average civil servant, you know, the same people that you have uh, nowadays working in, in similar roles. Now, you just mentioned um, a certain um, biographical uh, connection here. Your father um, survived uh, and uh, um, your father also was a survivor and, and a wonderful actor, Evin Gershenek, that is. And we've just heard that you didn't actually shoot the interior scenes in the actual building, but in a studio. Uh, so just the exterior shots were shot uh, on the premises. And as you said, you wanted to create something uh, of, of a board meeting feeling um, to uh, not depict um, uh, the actors as, as monsters. And Heidrich uh, might be one example. Um, Felix Hofmeier is uh, someone that takes a very jovial approach here. You know, a lot of hidden smiles and uh, certainly seems uh, empathetic and a, a bit like a coach even in that context. And um, how exactly did you manage that? How did you work with the actress to achieve that? Well, he's here, so I can't uh, really claim to have created that. I think I've supported them, helped them moving in that direction, but ultimately it's the actor, or let's, let's put it differently, when what do you focus on? Um, which path do you follow? And there are a variety of approaches. When we start working on a movie, uh, if it's a historic movie at that, um, we often look at other feature films that have come before. And it might have been that we could have tried to look back at a certain terminology that uh, the Nazis used and uh, try to include that uh, and reinterpret that for our movie. But that, I think, is a decision for a director to make, that you have to wonder how you create an effect without knowing how exactly people are going to perceive it. So you finish a film and then you receive feedback um, from journalists, from people that watch the movie. And you know, coming back to, to the question of why we did this and why I think it's important to show in the year 2022 is that it's different actors and we have younger actors and it is often surprising if you learn how young uh, people were uh, 1942. We have Heidrich um, in, in his 30s, um, we have Eichmann in early 30s, so it's young men that uh, and that is something that um, fascinated me, that in a very short amount of time, uh, moved up, were promoted once or even twice uh, 
occur here. So nine years after the Nazis took power in 1933, so seeing the time frame here, that was, I think, very much surprising, the shortness of it, how quickly everything happened and developed. And what you said about the personal history, family history, that did influence me, of course, but it is something that I grew up with. My father uh, survived three concentration camps uh, and the sinking of the Capacona, ultimately, um, and that is something that plays a role and that also doesn't play a role at the same time. Now, what you asked about, you know, working with the actors, um, you know, they are very smart actors and you could picture this like in an orchestra uh, and we, we didn't do any rehearsals, uh, rehearsals either. Um, during the, the actual shooting of the movie. And what I think was interesting was um, how we approached shooting the film. It's, it's not magical, but it's a bit like um, an orchestra and uh, the conductor, you know, can be, be louder or less loud, of course. And I think if you trust uh, one another. And I think that happened quite um, quickly. You can't really force that. Um, if you have that trust, you can communicate uh, on a non-verbal level and you can create an effect working with people that are brilliant, that are smart and that are empathetic um, and have a somber approach. And I think it is surprising sometimes for actors themselves what they end up with, you know, the energy that they create create in the process of creating, it becomes something self-fulfilling in the course of shooting the movie. And this is something that is also true what happened there. Every single one of these people, every single one of the uh, branches of government represented there defends their own turf. Um, Heydrich, of course, um, that I tried with Sofmeyer together, tried to, to give him more of, of an objective uh, tone because he wants to convince people. He uh, wants um, to uh, have, uh, as, as he has Adolf Eichmann uh, on, on his uh, right, his uh, right hand, so to say, um, and you know, they didn't really have to act, um, Mr. Deal. You know, you, you can be afraid of him anyway, so he didn't have to act that. So I think this approach was something that, um, to a certain degree, they, they didn't have to, um, to act, but they just have to convey their interests. So it was very much about power. And Heydrich wanted, um, in organizing the final solution, he wanted to make sure that his position in power was maintained. Now, you just mentioned um, the interests uh, and uh, the interests of uh, maintaining power, and I think the subtext um, here is, is interesting as well, because they were quite diverse interests uh, and opposite interests even, that um, you know, some wanted to have uh, workers on the one hand uh, for the industries, on the other hand, um, uh, really an, an approach uh, of, of, deter, uh, of um, exterminating people. And um, I think that that is quite an opposition there. And Deborah, um, as, as we just heard, 105 minutes of, of Nazi terminology and anti-Semitism that you have to endure, that you have to suffer, um, is that something that plays a role in, in your um, educational uh, work that you do at the um, House of the Wannsee? Well, I actually want to come back to uh, an earlier uh, question that you asked um, that uh, I was able to avoid back then, but as uh, Mr. Geschenek said, he grew up with that history, and, and as you asked, what, what happens if you work at such a place? Uh, and what I found um, quite surprising in recent weeks when people kept asking me this um, was that... Um, 
dann beginnt die Auseinandersetzung mit etwas. Move on to the premises, so uh, the garden, uh, let's say, you start uh, thinking about these issues, and then when you leave your place of work, you stop doing that. And that's not quite true, because for me personally, um, I, I can't really say whether this house itself, if that does more to me than just walking the streets of Berlin and this is a story, a history that is always present. Uh, I didn't really have the, the privilege in my own family whether I wanted to deal with this past or face this past or not. It, it was always there, it was always present, and, uh, and, and I can also answer your second question. Knowing what happened when, I mean, we can take soil from everywhere in the world, but especially from the German Reich. Um, don't trust a um, public green. But the Nazi language for 105 minutes. Yes, in the film you are very directly confronted with the ideology of the Nazis and anti-Semitism is a elementary part of this ideological way of looking at the world. And this stylistic approach of doing this through language that you've just mentioned with this directness and clarity is on the one hand shocking and on the other hand the language is very cold, very somber, which for us as an audience gives us a possibility to reflect upon it, at least that's the hope I have. But still, it can happen that people watch the movie. It's still possible that people talk about other people that way and they say he's a quarter Jew or an eighth of a Jew. So it could happen that certain terms, the mixed race issue is mentioned, that people take up terms without thinking about them, without Aber reflecting genau, what they the actually mean. So the question is, how can you make a movie about Sprache, uh, January 20th, 1942 without putting it in the respective context. I mean, that's difficult enough. How did you succeed in doing that? But Martin Muscovich, you said you saw the film only once and you do not want to watch it a second time at the moment. What, why, why is that um, compared to movies about the Shoah, like Schindler's List, or I mean, there are so many examples that we heard and that Janine Meerapfel mentioned in the beginning. There are the big documentaries and everything, but a documentary is different than a feature film, right? That's difficult to answer. I cannot tell you that in detail. I watched Schindler's List. My father, who is the only survivor of the family, Spielberg fan, sein ganzes Leben lang war, has um, and had been a fan of um, Spielberg throughout his entire life, but he didn't watch Schindler's List. He thought about it for a long time, but he ended up not doing it. In this case, I think, as opposed to the films that are set in concentration camps, the spoken word here is transformed into something that had an impact on 11 million people. And this has an impact on me. The words trigger an action. As I said, the film is excellent. 
der vorliegenden Filme so gut gelungen ist, none of the previous so films have worked um, out aber, as excellently um, as this mich, one did, gesagt, but ich, mich es in my zu, case, um, I am um, too much ich, um, ich, uh, emotionally affected by it. Möchte sozusagen I nicht dem don't finde es want to put myself als, uh, und auch alle anderen, die in der into this, and I think it's great that Kraft gehabt haben, sich über Mati Geschenek and everybody else who was involved in it was strong enough to deal with this for such a long time with this language throughout the writing of the script, the cutting and everything. And I mean, in the way this language works, um, I mean, it's a lot to take. Yes, the language is extraordinary on the one hand, this bureaucratization, but on the other hand, this higher power, this responsibility that was given to this one generation to rescue the world. I mean, this rhetoric, this um, ideology became very clear. I suggest that we um, invite the actors because some questions have already been asked. Um, if you want to, and this is very voluntary now, but if you want to, I would very much appreciate it if you could tell us how you went into this. What's the idea that you have when, you, when you're offered a script like this? You have to think about it. And I mean, you were already described as very smart. So this is great. The intelligent colleagues, I'd like to hear from you. A round of applause. Jakob Diel, Philipp Hochmeier, Peter Jordan. Excellent. And you've all brought your microphones. Good evening. Ja, wollen Sie einfach mal ein bisschen loslegen? Now, do you want to loslegen, just tell us a little bit, Philip? Also, ja, ein langer Prozess, da hineinzukommen. Yes, it's, 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 it's a long process of getting into um, this, and um, it was um, a long path for me as well, because, uh, uh, but because of the wise and um, empathic leadership of Mati, it succeeded. Um, it was the right way. So for me personally, I um, have a, a, a reading and writing difficulty, so it takes a long time for me to go through scripts and I had to repeat the script again and again um, until I finally memorized it, um, doing it every day for two months. That was um, a very special um, situation, very special experience. And the time I needed to learn it was the same that I also needed to get rid of it again. I mean, I really had a very special task of letting go of it again. I mean, these are words, um, formulas that creep into your mind and I needed to get rid of that. Okay, Jakob Diel. My experience was that I joined the project quite late. When I read the script, I thought the script was extraordinary. At that point, I didn't know Mati personally and the script has a certain levity to it and the way it starts, the rhythm it dictates. I mean, they clearly talk about things, but at the same time, they clearly don't talk about things. There's a lot between the lines and that's um, almost scary to a certain extent. And that um, really drew me into the script and then I saw that I or my character actually doesn't have that many lines. Well, but you always look in a very uh, impressive way. Yes, but I mean, we, Mati didn't tell me a lot either. We um, came to a solution. Wait, wait, let me interrupt here. Let me interrupt here. I already mentioned this, but the characters, if you put an actor into a uniform, Gauleiter, Obergruppenführer, comb their hair, put them into a uniform, put some makeup on them, describe what the power is that he has, then 
he will find a way into his character. And when the three were sitting there, Markus Schleinzer, who is um, not here, was sitting in the middle, then Heidrich, Obergruppenführer, and the head of Gestapo, Müller, da ergibt sich sehr vieles von selbst. Portrayed by Jakob Diel. A lot of things just happen naturally. I told him, you don't have to act a lot. You are this character. Everybody's afraid of you anyway. So he was a central character for the camera, for us. And next to him, the more moderate character, as opposed to Jakob, he had a lot more lines der, Philip äh, as Heidrich and I asked him to win over äh, äh, the others äh, to not zu spielen, be the wir hatten ein apodictic commander. We had a little code word. Um, there used to be a um, cigarette, a brand of cigarettes called mild. And I, already, I always told him mild, mild. And it was very difficult for him to get into this mild emotion, but it was very difficult for him to Combine the power that Heydrich emanates with this mild-natured, more moderate character, which I think doesn't really exist that much, at least not as much as it is now currently being described in the press. And this combination has an immense effect. And then this Gauleiter, who had the highest rank, the highest position, I mean, he's the only one he welcomes personally with a shake of hand, so Gauleiter... I think he was the Gauleiter of Lippe Nord, Estonia, Lithuania, so a very small region that he was responsible for, yet he was a central character. And Peter, who arrived at 8.30 on time, and hours later he was still on point, so I told the others, use him as an example. So what do I want to say with this? Everybody found their place, everybody found their character, and for five and a half weeks, that was the time that we spent in the studios of Berlino Union Film, they stuck to that, and for me this was a blessing, because the actual days of shooting were tough. We haven't heard about um, from you, Peter Joran, yet. Well, I had a diff different set of glasses in the film, and I also didn't have a lot of lines. But it's true, you get a uniform, and that's always a danger when you put an actor into a uniform or any other clothes. We want to do something with this. And sure, we understand what we're doing with this film. We understand the responsibility and the danger. Yet still, you stand in front of the mirror and you say, wow, this kind of looks great, but can I now behave that way? Should I? Should I not? Then you leave the room, then somebody explains the set to you, and then you're standing in front of the um, green screen, and you think about how would I be standing if I were standing in front of the actual lake? So maybe... I you know, stand erect, that looks better, gives you better posture. I mean, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. I mean, even, we're, even though we're here and everything is good, but this is the way it is. Actors are slightly vain. And then you think maybe it's wrong, I don't know what to do, and then the director comes and tells you, don't do it this way. And then you sit down and you see that everybody else has understood what it is the director wants. So you can't do anything that's nonsensical. You immediately understand what it is about. So I thought, let's just leave both of my hands on the chair. And only in certain situations, I put my hands on the table. And then that's how you sit for nine hours, because you're not being told that you can do more, because that's not what it's about. And that's what he told us. And funnily enough, it worked for all of us. Maybe you don't think that we are able to do this, but for four weeks we actually sat and we stood for one week, which was this scene in the foyer. And we always knew what we were doing because of the director. 
Although sometimes, because of the routine, you think, ah, let's change something today. But no, it's something you shouldn't do, not because of the topic, not because of the script, not because of the costume. And I've never experienced this at a set, and this was really extraordinary as well. So, to a certain extent, this was due to the fact that um, the whole load was on our shoulders. We didn't dare to do anything, but also because it wasn't necessary to do more, to produce something, to act something, to play act. There was a short description of the characters, and when I put on the costume, I read this description and I knew I'm not going to do anything today. I'm just going to say my lines and then maybe turn my head because there wasn't more to do, because nothing more happened. And this is what this movie is about. This is how simple evil is. This is how banal even is, how trite it is. Yeah, a meeting with a subsequent breakfast. Yes, and the director set the tone and we followed it. Thank you very much for these descriptions. It's nice that you've come. And I would like to collect questions from the audience. Are there questions? Audible for everyone. If you could repeat your question. Yeah, the, the thing I still don't understand is who said, let's do this movie? I mean, everyone says they've been asked to do it. Um, and I'd also like to know, um, Konstantin Film is as a capitalist uh, company. What marketing strategy do you use um, to promote this? What do you expect uh, in terms of uh, an ideal return on investment? Um, what per percentage points. Um, are you sure about this? Uh, well, I don't know if we want to lay out the business plan for that. I'd also like to know about festivals. Are you going to show that on festivals or is it just going to be on television? Well, let me talk a bit about um, how exactly um, this uh, came about. Um, Mr. Adgar had the idea, one of the three producers, uh, of um, the film, uh, one of the three people responsible for it, and that quite quickly then went to uh, Oliver Berben, who is responsible for this uh, uh, business at uh, Konstantin Film, and they put together a group of, of people that would ultimately develop uh, this project uh, with Mati Gajanik, with um, Bartot, uh, Rainer Gertschold, uh, who is in the audience as well. And that is uh, something that we produced for the ZDF, um, a German uh, television uh, outlet, and it was uh, financed mainly uh, by the uh, ZDF as well. There were uh, some subsidies, uh, some funding that we received, um, but mainly ZDF. So this is how this came about, ultimately. And we sold the rights um, to screen this to over 20 countries. It's also going to be screened uh, in cinemas, so not just on television or via streaming platforms. A couple of uh, countries uh, bought uh, the rights here to show this in cinemas. But our reasons to do this movie were not driven by economic uh, interests. Well, what, what kind of figure are you looking for then? Okay, I mean, I think it's, it's better not to just um, you know, focus on, on the numbers here. Maybe that's not the most interesting part uh, of this. Um, maybe there are more interesting aspects to this. I mean, are there other questions from the audience uh, or maybe comments that you might have? Please, go ahead. We've got a mic for you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you so much for this impressive, remarkable um, movie. And I think it was a great choice not to uh, use any music, uh, uh, no cinematic music, because I think it would uh, have, uh, you know, caused the wrong uh, impression. Um, a question that I would have is, uh, how exactly did the actors um, approach the biographies of the perpetrators 
of the time. How did they get access to that? Well, thank you very much um, for that question. And um, Mati Kaschenik, um, let me add to that. Uh, you know, working with the material, what kind of historic material did you use in order to prepare for the movie? And what material could you uh, actually provide to the actors? Well, the respective uh, historical figures are exactly that, historical figures, and uh, for some we have more information, more biographical information, uh, for some less, uh, but still it's, it's a fiction, and uh, we you know, didn't actually look for actors that looked similar to the uh, historical figures, uh, because, I mean, Heidrich, for example, he looked different and he talked in a different way as well. And Müller as well. He looked different as well. Eichmann as well. So we, we do have images and photographs of these people. And uh, Eichmann, probably the uh, most, uh, uh, or the one that people know most about, um, that people think of um, the trial in Israel in the 1960s. Uh, Heidrich, he is probably most known um, for um, the, the assassination uh, attempt uh, in, in May of 1942. And um, so I think a, a lot of this uh, came about uh, in, in the course of um, events. And for me, what was not uh, in the focus was what they actually looked like or you know, create similarities. And I also, of course, uh, told the actors that they were um, free to look into the biographies and to look at literature about these uh, historical figures. But ultimately, what um, I thought was important is, is that most of these decisions have been made intuitively. And I asked all the actors to, sure, look at the source material, but uh, please also think about the interests of that character, of that historical figure that they might have uh, wanted um, to defend back then in order to create this interaction between people. And I think this is very important. They create their very own world in that room. So what we are doing is we are producing a feature film to the best of our knowledge um, of the Wannsee Conference, um, something that was declared the Wannsee Conference after the fact, after the war, because as you, you said, um, it, it was uh, basically a business meeting uh, with uh, a um, uh, breakfast afterwards. So it, we, we know very little about that. Um, so I think, and that was very surprising, actually when I visited um, the villa uh, for the first time and I talked uh, to Dr. Yash, um, uh, head of uh, um, the uh, Wannsee uh, House um, back then, and I asked him, well, did that happen in this room? And he said, yes, it certainly did. And I asked him, well, what about this table? I mean, they probably put it here in, in the middle of the room, right? Because I knew the scenery from the two prior movies, which happened around a big table. And he said, well, I'm actually not sure if it was one table. Maybe they put together a couple of tables. And Eichmann said during his trial um, that he was uh, sitting on a side table or at a side table, not at the main table. So we included that in the movie. And what I found interesting in the two uh, movies that I saw, the prior um, uh, productions, uh, was that it was very difficult for the cameraman to actually shoot the scenes because they had to move around, around that table in this room. And it was very difficult for them to shoot this over shoulder because everyone was sitting at one table and it was very difficult for the audience to understand who is who that's sitting here at this table. And 
I, of course, looked at conference rooms, meeting rooms that people use nowadays. And um, you know, I've, I've never been at a board meeting myself, um, but that's the setup that apparently they use. I mean, you have um, Heidrich in this, in our case, uh, and Müller and someone that joined them here at, at the very uh, top of um, the table. And then we had a table on the side with Eichmann and his secretary. And then on the left and right hand side, in a, in a sort of U shape, um, you have um, the seating for all the civil servants, uh, the uh, representatives of the ministries, um, Leibrand and and um, Müller, for example, and the two uh, from the SS um, on the other side. And that created a sort of a composition that people are very familiar with, uh, that they know from uh, the uh, movie banners as well, uh, where you have this group sitting there together in a fairly strict hierarchical order as well. And at its center, you have um, Mahadri at the top of the table. Now, I'd like again to invite um, the actress, um, Philip, um, for example. How did you approach the biographies? Well, I certainly did. I mean, there are great um, biographies that you can watch on YouTube. And I think um, Heidrich's life is, is fascinating in, in a very terrible way. And he is uh, a deeply troubled, it was a deeply troubled person. And I think it's it's good for us to talk about this, to put this uh, into perspective. But I think it wasn't essential for us shooting the movie. So I looked at it, and you have to be able to put it aside when you shoot the movie. I mean, there's um, an anecdote that he put a crown on his head when he was in Prague. And, um, you know, there is uh, the myth that um, uh, your your first son would die if you, uh, without justification, put a crown on your head and break. And that's what happened to him. But I think this didn't really have any room to put in, in the movie. And Jakob Diel, um, maybe what... Um, do you think, how did you approach this? Uh, well, I can just um, second what um, Philip said, um, that it wasn't essential. Um, I think um, you know, taking this radicalism for granted as, as an everyday thing, that I think was important. You know, As someone that knew what the goal was of this meeting, what the objective was, I think that is important. Um, and that people expect a certain strategy, of course, to be employed in order to achieve their targets. Well, I didn't have a lot of um, material. There were a couple of pictures um, and um, a, a biography without a lot of information. He, he was important in the Third Reich, but there wasn't really a lot of information about uh, Mr. Meyer. Uh, there's this one fact that I thought was quite interesting in, in order to... Uh, um, ...better show how this person might have been, might have acted, um, was that the fact that um, uh, this character, this historical uh, figure, uh, sat down in uh, Saarland, uh, in the southwest of Germany, uh, and sat um, below a rock and uh, he committed suicide. He took his own life. And I think it, it says a lot about a person if they go into nature, you know, that, that people um, write about and talk about. They go into that nature and they put themselves into a scene in order to commit uh, suicide. And I think that gave me somewhat of an idea of, of how to shape this character. So that was one of the things that inspired me. There are a couple of moments during the film where you think, well, wow, what's happening right now? There's this humaneness uh, coming to the surface. Someone asking, well, is that humane what we're doing? And then, of course, this gets turned on its head uh, by realizing that it's not about the Jews. It's about about the soldiers. So there are certainly a lot of moments with tension in them, and one might wonder, is it okay for us to empathize with the perpetrators because we don't depict them as monsters, um, but 
which show them as inhumane with certain pseudo-humane moments uh, in a very specific context, um, of course. Um, but there are certain moments where you certainly despise the character, but um, you might empathize. Is that something that's okay? <laughs> Well, now, all my colleagues from the uh, Wannsee Conference, um, if you can support me here on this uh, if you like. Uh, feel free to join in from the audience. But uh, from our point of view, from an educational point of view, how we want to face and educate about history, uh, I wouldn't overemphasize that. So I wouldn't talk about Heydrich as someone that was entirely out of his mind, that was crazy. Ultimately, we don't really know, of course. Uh, we don't know that much about who they actually were, if they had that empathy or not. Because ultimately, there were normal people, fathers uh, of, of children living in a family, and they certainly had um, their good sides. Um, so from that point of view, I mean, yes, certainly you might feel empathy for them. Is that something that you should do or not? I, I don't really think that I'm in, in a position to, to uh, comment on that. Well, that might be a question that you face in your educational work, doesn't it? And uh, Mr. Moskovich, uh, he's uh, shaking his head. I mean, interesting to, to hear uh, from uh, from you as well. Well, I think that that's the de dilemma, isn't it? That we are wondering, you know, should we empathize with uh, our grandfather that did this or that uh, back then? So I think this is a very difficult discussion to have, uh, how do you perceive their decisions that they made at that point, and how do I treat them as I've uh, gotten to know them in a completely different context? And you talked about anti-Semitism. Uh, the question is more importantly uh, about whether the movie creates a, a chasm between its depiction and the normal, the German depiction or perception. And I think this is something that is very interesting for us as we're working in education in this very building, as we're dealing with this history. I think that is more important if it uh, takes a different approach, if it shows a different point of view. And I think we, we don't just want to have um, Rudolf Lange as the only one uh, sharing his point of view because he shot thousands of, of Jews uh, in Riga the day before the uh, Wannsee conference. No, we don't want to see his point of view only, but also the uh, point of view of Jews, for example, that have been deported and on that very day that Rudolf Lange boards the plane to fly to Berlin, to Wannsee, uh, Schlamme Berliner, who was uh, interned uh, in a concentration camp, he was able to free himself uh, and uh, to fight his way to the Warsaw ghetto. So I think it's important to have a variety of uh, points of view, and that is important for us today, on the 20th of January 2022. We want to include all these points of view and engage with them, look at the tension between them. Now, the question whether you empathize with someone like Rudolf Lange, that is not that important. Mr. Moskovich, um, you were shaking your head uh, earlier, and a uh, bit of a mean question, isn't it? Well, I think um, that this uh, group of, of people planned within a couple of hours, planned uh, the murder of millions of people. So just you know, simply asking the question um, whether you might empathize with them just because they're talking about um, you know, the, the plans they have with their children or vacation plans, I think um, that 
it doesn't really make a lot of sense, and I don't really think that it, it's it's a relevant threat uh, that that we might empathize with them because of that. Uh, I think um, uh, morally, if you, you have a clear bearing uh, that uh, avoids that from happening, and of course there are roles uh, or uh, characters that are negative, but I think it's not the point uh, in this context here. What the point here is that what happened here was that the biggest crime that you could fathom happening and being planned in such a bureaucratic way and being decided in such a bureaucratic way. And then, you know, really thinking about whether one of these murderers has empathy or not, if you like them or not, if you find them more or less likable, I think that that's a, a ludicrous question that uh, is difficult to answer and isn't important to be answered. Um, I think that, and, and that's important um, for me to note and to comment uh, on our discussion about the, the stylistic approach of the whole production and then the cleanliness that we're seeing. Uh, and there is um, almost like um, a genre of uh, single location uh, movies, a variety of uh, movies that uh, are shot at one location in one room. And Matej Gershonek um, really did an amazing job here at uh, setting this up, and they really thought about the visual concept here. There's not a lot of uh, camera movements, a lot of uh, fixed shots that they're taking. I think that is a much more interesting question, actually, because that allows you to better understand a director um, and, and a director's thoughts of how to actually frame this monstrosity that is happening there and not turning that into just another movie. I mean, you could have done anything, you know, camera movements, you could have uh, tried to change things up, and that's what you didn't do. It's, it's a, almost a Bergmanesque approach, a strictness to the visual uh, concept. And I think that is something that is remarkable and sets this apart. Mati Geschenek, and then one more question. Yes, let me say one thing. It's true, but it's not entirely true. Each and every shot is different, and we deliberately chose that. You just don't notice it. There's also a light movement in each shot, and there's a reason for the cutting process then as well. If you do a film without a score, it needs to flow. If you just have have static shots, it wouldn't work. I mean, if you pay close attention, you see that the camera does move throughout the entire movie, almost imperceptibly. I had a Dutch cinematographer, Holo Birkens, um, who I've worked with for quite some time. We've done that repeatedly. We worked with different lenses. We didn't use a lot of lenses, but we um, worked with just a few lenses and here with a rather long focal length, and each and every shot is different, yet still you have the feeling that it is static and very quiet, but we do have the moving camera. And if you do the math, it's actually quite a lot. But at some point we came up with this, and I don't know where we took that from, but it worked quite nicely to work with um, certain lenses like that, because the effect is that for a longer distance you end up with a movement that isn't really perceived. Two more questions from the audience. You have requested the floor for quite some time, and then after that, Deidre Berger. I hope you can understand me. I have a very concrete question which is directed at Mati Geschenek. While you were in production, did you ever think 
about connecting the story of the Wannsee Conference to a second plot or a second location. I'm asking for various reasons. On the one hand, um, we talked about empathy, and I wouldn't necessarily want to talk about empathy, but rather ask the question differently. How can you get into the heads of the people using cinematographic means? And you did that nicely, but maybe you could have done that with um, one of the people on the margins, um, Schoengard or Lange or somebody, based on the um, protocol, on the minutes, and um, put that into the script. So first, how can you get into the minds of these people? Then second, um, the actual location, the house of the Wannsee Conference, is not very um, authentic. We, do have a, we, we don't have, have a lot of authentic um, locations in Germany. You said it yourself, the table, where exactly was it located, where exactly was the meeting, etc. So w was that a reason to maybe think of um, another location? And then in the very beginning, you also said we already had two prior movies, the one from the 1980s, which was, I think, also called the Wednesday Conference, is very similar from today's point of view, um, outdated, but very similar. So to avoid falling into the trap of reproducing with modern means something that has already existed in a comparable way. So I'd be interested in whether these three ideas played a role, and if so, when you made the decision to use the basic setting of just one location and the very straightforward plot. That's quite a number of questions. Sure. Um, in the run-up phase, we did have these thoughts. I remember when we started, there was the idea of they get up in the morning, everybody with their families, and then one person arrives by plane, the other um, arrives from the brothel, and the other from somewhere else, and then they meet. One arrives by um, car, the other by bike. I mean, we did have all these ideas because you approach an idea. There were parallel plots, parallel stories that we were um, thinking about, maybe with a Jewish gardener, etc. So there are a lot of different versions that exist when you approach a project like this, and parallel plots are always part and parcel of this, but at the end of the day, the this is the extracted version now, and at some point the decision has to be made, and it is made conjunctly, and this was our joint discussion, namely, or this was our joint decision, namely to concentrate on this location, this meeting, this conference, and what fascinated me, and still fascinates me, i.e. scares me, is what people are able to do, and that this didn't happen that long ago. This used to be the present. This used to be today. At the end of the day, this is us, and that's what our actors also knew. They knew that they don't have to act, don't have to pretend to be these historic, historical characters, but they just come in, assume the characters, and then relationships develop between these peoples. This irrespective of what their interests are, the interests of the ministries, uh, what their ranks are, etc. And it's a miracle, as it is with any other movie as well, but here especially because the effect of this interaction that I'm noticing now when I see the reactions of people who are watching the film or who have seen the film, and I can only hope that it's um, a good reaction when people watch it, that it enrages you as well, and that you discuss um, it also controversially. That's why we did it. One last question. Deidre Berger, please. Thank you very much to everybody. This is extremely intense. It is a very special film. I don't know if I can watch it um, a second time, not because it wasn't good, but because the last 
10, 15 minutes were almost unbearable. And Mr. Gashinik, you answered the question to a certain extent already, but what does it do with you when you come together one day after the other in a very intense way to deal with this material, evil incarnate? I mean, this has to do something with you. You learn about the Holocaust in school in theory, that's one thing, but putting yourself into a person that was thinking like that, how did you do this and maybe what did you take away from this very in-depth way of dealing with it? I think this is a question directed at the actors. It's a process. It starts with somebody telling you that this is a role that's offered to you. And then you think, oh, sweet Lord. You see the picture, you know what it's about, and you think, do I want to do this? Can I do it? Is it possible? Then you get the script. You read the script, and what you've learned in school hopefully becomes present again, and then you think about it, and you think, ah, I probably can't do it, but then again, it's just acting. It is important. It needs to be done. It'll work one way or the other. Then you go, you see your colleagues wearing the costumes, and you think, ooh, now this is getting serious. And then the actual working process begins. We are working actors. We study the text. We um, are being told where to sit and how to act. And then you do 15 takes per um, sentence, maybe just three, depending on how it works. This is the work, uh, working process. And then after a couple of days, it becomes more of a routine. And towards the end, it doesn't become more relaxed or loose, but you don't focus on the topic that much anymore. You focus on the work. You try to avoid mistakes. You try to make it easier for the camera. And then at some point the shooting is over and you're exhausted because you were so much in the concentration of the work and then the actual understanding happens later. You're back home and you're hit by it. You think about it. Those figures, the numbers, the names, 11 million, and then especially, and um, this impressed me very much with Mr. Um, Altmaier, how he shows the um, charts, the badly made charts, and the somber factual tone that he uses the lingo that's used, the special treatment, that lingers. That's something that hit me when you're invited. Hey, come on, let's meet. There's a screening. We can watch the movie. And you think, oh, great, I meet the colleagues again. What I underestimated was that the actual film that we had worked on for weeks comes down on me for 90 minutes straight, and it really did hit me. I thought I see the colleagues again, we can watch it, and it's going to be interesting. You want to see the work you did, but it's everything came back that you pushed away while you were working, and it's not that this does not have an impact on you. No, you push it away, you focus on the routine, also the fact that once per week your hair is cut so that it still looks the same. Everything is routine and it works nicely, as it probably was for those gentlemen as well. That's an idea that you also have in the back of your mind. And then your hair grows and then you meet again. And a year later, you're really hit by it and you think, what did I do or what, what did I participate in? And as it was already said in the beginning here, everything we are doing to commemorate this day or these days will not be enough. Neither will this movie. It's just one attempt. And we're proud or happy. I mean, I am proud and happy that I was part of it and that I'm able to participate in something that commemorates this. But it's definitely, definitely something that leaves traces. These simple things stick to your mind. Anybody who'd like to add something? 
As I already said in the beginning, it took me a long time to let go again. I've never had that before. I um, sat in, um, in, in, in my locker for quite some time. I um, walked home for one and a half hours because sitting for such a long time and then going through these strange words again and again drives you crazy and also goes deep into your soul and I needed to get rid of this and I've never had that with a character before that it takes so long to really wash it off day after day to cleanse my soul yes thank you these are strong words I'm interested to see what the discussions will be that this movie will trigger. Thank you, everybody who participated in this um, talk. Um, Martin Moskowitz, um, Deborah Hartmann, Mati Gesenek, um, Philipp Hochmeier, Jakob Diel, Peter Jordan, the actors. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you to you, the audience, for being here. Thank you very much to Konstantin Film and ZDF. And thank you to you who have joined us virtually. Thank you for being with us. Good night and stay healthy.